Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our video in the series on tax administration. In this video, we continue from where we left off and we look at certain additional concepts and principles in the area of documents, maintenance requirements, returns you have to file. And then we begin to look at areas around tax dispute resolution. If the Commissioner General issues an assessment and you do not agree with him, how do you go about objecting? And all other relevant or related provisions. So let's look quickly at the document maintenance requirement or what type of documents you need to maintain as part of your tax compliance process. First thing we need to emphasize here is that you are required to maintain your document within the country. You need to keep your documents in Ghana as much as possible. So a person is required to maintain within Ghana necessary records one, to provide information in respect of documents to be filed with the Commissioner General under a tax law. Two, to enable an accurate determination of their tax payable under any tax law. And three, any other requirements or records that may be prescribed by the Commissioner General or by any regulations that will be passed under the Revenue Administration Act. So it's important to remember that the law stresses on keeping documents in Ghana. It's important to have your documents maintained within the country. We are saying for the purpose of this, your necessary records will include a number of things such as underlying documents, however described in the nature of receipts, invoices, vouchers, contracts, or in the case of electronic records, any medium by which the information can be extracted. So you need to ensure that every transaction you enter into, that will have a tax implication, that will have a tax impact any dealing any contract you sign any payment you make ensure that you keep accurate records don't forget that our company's act of 2019 act 992 also has certain document retention requirements for companies so this is an offshoot it's another extension of requirements for a company or an entity or a taxpayer in general to keep certain relevant documents within ghana as in a document referred to in this particular discussion is required to be retained for at least six years from the relevant date or for a number of periods, whichever is longer. So take away point from here is that you need to ensure that your documents are number one, kept in Ghana, number two, kept to support every transaction you've entered into, any contract you've signed, any payment you've made, any amount of money you've received. Ensure that whatever transaction you do, whatever dealings you enter into as a business, you have adequate records to support these. And you must keep these documents for at least six years. So your minimum document retention period is six years. It's either six years or a number of periods, whichever is longer. So you're saying the first thing is where you object to a tax decision. So the Commissioner General tells you he has issued an assessment on you. He thinks you owe him a million Ghana CDs. You are like, I don't agree with you. Once you object, then we are saying that in the case of objections or appealing against another tax decision is made, then you are required to keep your document until the matter is decided and the decision is executed. So if you don't agree with him, then the six year period may even be longer. So if you are, you are in a dispute with the Commissioner General for longer, then you are required to keep the document for as long as the dispute keeps running and until it's settled. So remember, six years would be the minimum. In the case of a dispute, it could be longer up to when the dispute is eventually resolved. Next thing to remember is second time period will be where you make an application to the Commissioner General. Then a document relevant to that application is required to be retained until the application is determined. So if you apply to him for anything, it could be anything under any tax law, you write to him for an application, an approval or anything, you are required to keep your document until he comes back to you with his response. Obviously, under different applications, the law gives different time periods within which a commissioner is required to get back to you. But before he does, and until he does, you are required to keep your document until the application is determined. Don't forget a six year period is the default, but if it takes longer than six years for him to get back to you on an application, you're required to keep the documents. Although in practice, 
I don't expect the Commissioner General to take six years or longer to reply to an application. It's not feasible. The next is where you have gone to apply for a refund of tax, then you are required to keep your document until the refund is made. So once again, if you apply for a refund and it takes longer than six years, then you should keep it for the longer period. But in essence, I don't think a refund will drag for six years. It's possible, but I think I've seen three years plus. But I'm here to see one that runs for six years, but it's not anything is uh, possible. Next is where you've received a notice of investigation by the Commissioner General. Then you are required to retain the document until the Commissioner General notifies you in writing that he's done with the investigation. So if for any reason, Commissioner General writes to you and it's like, I want to investigate your books or records, maybe someone tipped him off or whatever, then you are required to retain the document until he writes to you to tell you, listen, I'm done with my investigation, I have my findings, you don't need to keep the document any longer. So remember, general document retention rule, it should be a minimum of six years, or you have to keep it for six years, subject to a number of periods which we've gone through. So it could be longer, depending on when the number of issues are discussed, will be resolved or um, concluded. I'm saying despite all of these discussions, the Commissioner General may serve a notice in writing that may relieve a person of the obligation to maintain documents or the time for which they are required to be retained. Or he may require a person to also retain documents with reasonable certainty in the notice. Long story short, despite all the six years period, all the um, longer than six years, if it's a refund or to refund is made, despite all of these, he can write to you and ask you to either um, stop maintaining documents for a certain period or extend the period. The power is in his hand to really do what he so wishes when it comes to um, some of these provisions. The requirement for a person to retain documents described with reasonable certainty in the notice or period specified applies whether or not the documents pertain to your tax affairs. So it's saying here that when he writes to you to retain certain documents, it doesn't matter whether or not those documents relate to your particular tax affairs. It could be someone else's. But once he's written to you to ask you to keep those documents because it will help him arrive at a certain tax decision, then you are required to comply. In all this discussion, when we say relevant dates in relation to a document, it means what it has to do with income tax, then is the end of the year of assessment or the years of assessment for which a document is relevant. If it's VAT, there's the end of the accounting period or period for which a document is relevant. In the case of all other taxes, then there's a the last date on which a taxpayer is obliged to file a tax return or other documents. So remember, um, document retention requirements um, under the Revenue Administration Act, it's quite straightforward, but these are key things to remember, especially for those who are just watching this one exam papers. Um, it's very important to remember these. Let's talk about tax returns now. This is something if you are practicing tax or when you start to practice tax or those after your exam, if you decide to become a tax practitioner, um, you will do a lot of return filing. You will work a lot of tax returns. So what does the law say about tax returns? So in a tax return to be filed by an individual shall be signed by that individual and shall have a declaration to the effect that the return is complete and accurate. I'll show you what a tax return looks like in the next few seconds. Um, but just know that on every return, there's a section at the bottom where you are required to declare or make a declaration that you are certifying that whatever you've written, whatever you've disclosed, whatever you've um, imprinted on the return is accurate to the very best of your knowledge. So here we are saying that if it's an individual, then that person must sign and make a declaration to the effect that the return is complete and accurate. If it is to be filed by an entity, then it's required to be signed by any duly authorized manager and shall have a declaration that the return is complete. So anyone in a managerial position, anyone with enough powers to kind of make some form of the decision can sign on behalf of an entity, make a declaration that to the best of their knowledge or to the best of their ability, what they know, that return um, shows a true and fair view of the tax um, affairs of the company with respect to that particular return. And here we are saying the Commissioner General may by notice 
require a person to file a tax return if before the date for filing of the tax returns, one, that person becomes bankrupt, is wound up or goes into liquidation. So we call, um, these are measures the Commissioner General does to kind of serve as a revenue protection measure. So people call this preemptive assessment or preemptive requirement. If for some reason he feels, if he waits for you to file by the due date, something may happen and he may not get his money from you, he has the power to require you to file a tax return even before the due date, just so revenue is protected, just so tax revenue is assured. So it's really a tax revenue assurance mechanism. If for any reason, number one, Commissioner General has a reason to believe that you may become bankrupt you may wind up or you may go into liquidation. It may require you to file a tax return even before the date is due. So for example, if you followed our VAT series, you would have realized or you'd have learned that VAT returns and National Health Insurance and Ghana Education Trust Fund levy returns are due on or before the last working day of the subsequent month to which the return relates. We've also studied, if you watch our videos on withholding taxes, that withholding tax returns are due on or before the 15th day of the next month following the month to which the transaction relates. What we are saying here is if the Commissioner General believes for some reason that you become bankrupt, your business will wind up or you go into liquidation, then he can write to you and say, yes, I know VAT returns are due before the last working day of the next month, but please file it today because I don't think by then you probably have the money to pay me the tax due. So this is something he has the power to do. He can bring forward your date for filing if he thinks um, you either become bankrupt, you wind up, or you go into liquidation. Next is if the Commissioner General believes on reasonable grounds that the person is about to leave Ghana indefinitely, he has a feeling that if he doesn't get you today to file your returns today, to make payments today, you may leave Ghana forever, then he can do that today, even though the date or the due date for the return is not yet here. The next is if he believes you are otherwise about to cease activity or business in Ghana. He, he heard rumors that your business is about to close down, you're about to stop business or move shop. He can say, listen, I have a feeling you're about to um, close your business or cease activity, cease trading. Please file your returns today and pay any taxes due. Next is if he has reason to believe that you have committed an offense under a tax law. And because you committed that offense, he feels it to be a cascading effect. You probably not comply with something else. You'll be like, you know what? Just file the return today and pay me my money. Next is if he considers it appropriate that you file a return, he will ask you to do that as well. So remember that these preemptive measures are there to ensure that, like I said, tax revenue is protected. If for some reason he believes that these things will happen or these circumstances listed here may happen, he may ask you to file a return earlier than the date already prescribed by the relevant tax law. Remember this very um, well, it's a key provision. Then we are saying this notice that he will make to you requiring you to file a tax return before it's even due. Number one, it must be in writing, so it will be a letter. He won't call you on phone to tell you. It will be a letter instructing you to file this and it will be served on you, the person. It will specify a number of things. It will specify number one, the period or part of the period or other events to be covered by the return. So he told you, file your return for maybe January to March or um, April to December. He will tell you the specific period. If it's just one month, he will let you know. He also lets you know the date by which the return must be filed. So he'll give you a date to be filed. He will create a new deadline for you aside the statutory filing deadline and you must com comply. If you don't, You'll be liable to the same penalties, the same interest as someone who would have flouted the usual deadline. So he brings forward your deadline for whatever reason, because he feels revenue is at risk and you must comply to the letter or else you'll be in big, big trouble. Now that we've spoken about returns, we've spoken about declarations, spoken about the possibility for the Commissioner General to require you to file a return even before your due date. How does a tax return look like? Obviously, there are lots of returns. Um, if I say hundreds, maybe I'll be exaggerating, but there are lots of tax returns. I'm showing you just two. On the left, we have a 
company self-assessment return this is really a revised assessment so um, when we begin to look at um, details around company taxes we'll pick returns and i'll show you how returns are completed but for now just notice how a return looks like on the right we have a vat return you can hit the pause button and try to zoom in you realize at the bottom they all have a declaration and it, it shows the person's name so i dash you put your name there you make a declaration you state your position you sign and then you write the date this is the declaration i was talking about this is you saying or this is you certifying that to the best of your ability everything you've put on a return is accurate so don't focus too much on the content of the return just know this is how a return looks like it has a gra and um, logo at the top it talks about um, the, the, the name of the taxpayer your tax identification number remember when we we're doing tax identification numbers in our previous lecture we said that you are required to state your tax identification number on every single document every single return you file with the commissioner general under any tax law so here you can see clearly that on every return there is a space or there are a number of boxes for you to um, input your tin so remember this carefully now like i've said the law gives you dates by which you must file your return but what if for some reason you are unable to meet those deadlines for some reason you're unable to file by the due date what provisions are available in law for that the law gives you room to extend the time to file the return and it's just fair because we have to ensure that one of the canons of um, tax tax in general is the principle of um, we have economy that is about collection so here let's talk about the principle of let's say even equity or fairness right to so the principle of equity this ensures that taxes are fair to all those concerned then another relevant principle here will be the principle of um, convenience so in as much as convenience will, will deal with um, tax offices being closer to taxpayers compliance being less burdensome on taxpayers one element of the convenience pillar is the fact that you give taxpayers the ability to flex the number of or the amount the periods within which you must comply so if you give someone room within which you can ask for extra time to comply then um, it's a more taxpayer friendly system so what do our laws say when it comes to extension of time to file returns let's say that person who is required to file a return or a tax return under any tax law may apply to the commissioner general for an extension of time to file the return so let him know i cannot i cannot meet the deadline so please give me extra time but what does the law say specifically about this application and the extra time you may be given the application number one should be in writing you must write a letter don't send a whatsapp message well there are interesting discussions that uh, because of the advent of technology if you send a whatsapp message it's in writing but please and please again in practice the expectation is that you write a letter to the commission you know, not an email right an email may pass in the coming um, years but for now in practice write a letter it must be in writing number two you must state the reasons for the request so let him know um because my audit has not been concluded for the 2020 year of assessment my financials have not been finalized my books of account are not yet fully in order so i want an extension or um my building got spent by some fire outbreak i lost a lot of my records so i need some time to get my backups prepare my financials and file so just let him know what has happened for which reason you need an extension of time to file a return and then you must make this application before the due date so don't wait for the due date to come and then you write to him for an application you will be denied you must file the application for extension of deadline before the deadline it only makes sense if you wait until that day to file then that day has already come and um, you'll be denied so take note after he gets this application he may by written notice to you extend the date by which your return is required to be filed if in his opinion you have shown reasonable cause so he reads your letter he feels what you said is reasonable is sensible he agrees with you he's like okay fine he'll write back to you and then he'll confirm so remember if you write for an extension of time 
What the law says is you must get a reply. There are some taxpayers who assume that as long as I've written to the Commissioner General for an extension of time, then it means I have it no. By law, he's required to write back to you to confirm the grant of the extension before it becomes effective. So here, he writes back to you, he's satisfied that you've shown reasonable cause, then he grants you the extension. But the extension will be subject to the terms and conditions that he will prescribe, including in some cases the payment of security. It's not too common. So he can ask you to deposit something just in case he doesn't hear from you again. But in essence, most times, you just reply and say he, he approves and um, can go ahead and file within the period. Key takeaway point from here is that he may grant you multiple extensions, but the extensions will not exceed 60 days in total from the date the return was originally due to be filed. So remember that if for some reason you write to the Commissioner General for an extension, let's even use an example, um, your company income tax uh, return, annual return, you are a company that has a 31st December year end. By law, you are required to file your annual company income tax return four months after the year has ended. So that will typically be April of the following year after your year has ended. If you write a commissioner general for an extension of time, what this is saying is that he can give you an extension, but it will not exceed 60 days. So all things being equal, the latest you can file is by the end of June. So those with 31st December year ends will typically say they have four months to file after year end, but with an extension, it can become an extra two months, giving them six months. So take note, he can give you multiple extensions, as many as he wants, but it will not exceed 60 days. So in practice, what he does is he just writes one letter to you and tells you you have an extra 60 days. He doesn't give you what I've seen in practice, doesn't give you 10 days and you go back and say I want unless you write to him specifically to tell him I want five days I want 10 days or give me 15 days I'll be I'll be ready by then but typically most taxpayers in order to avoid any uncertainty write to him and request for 60 days he writes back to them the ones I've seen he approves 60 days and then they have 60 days to comply so remember that he cannot give you more than 60 days he cannot give you more than two months effectively to um, extend the time to file your return then what you need to remember most importantly is that when he grants you an extension of time to file the return it doesn't change the due date for payment of the tax very important if the tax so let's say the return was due on 30th april and you had tax to pay on that particular date what this is saying is you must pay the tax so this is extension of time to file the return not extension of time to pay the tax there's a separate provision for that we'll cover um, in subsequent, a subsequent video on the same um, in the same series. But remember that if you write for an extension of time to file a return, it is only the return due date that has been extended. The date for paying the tax still remains that due date, so you must pay the tax. What this effectively means is, if you write for an extension of time to file a return on that same day, go and pay your tax and tell him, "I'll bring the return later on." So key thing to remember here is that when you get an extension of time to file a return it doesn't alter it doesn't change it doesn't vary the dates that the tax is originally due you must pay on that due date what happens or what are the rules around when you fail to file your tax return on time where a person fails to file their return by the due date as prescribed by any law the commissioner general has the power to appoint anybody, another person, to prepare and file their return on your behalf. Yes, he can do that. So you are required to file a return on a due date. You don't do it. He has the power to appoint someone to prepare the return on your behalf and file the return on your behalf. He has that power. Then he shall make an assessment of your liability, your tax liability, as required by a tax law, including by way of something we call an adjusted assessment, which we'll look at shortly. And for this purpose, he can use any information that he has available to him um, that he got from the person who filed on your behalf. Like he can make someone file a return on your behalf and he can use information reasonably available to him to assess you. So if you said you are not going to file, fine. He will use the information he can gather to file and um, assess you, get someone to file a return on your behalf and say, you owe $1 million or 1 million cities, come and pay today. So remember, he has a lot of power. 
then when you file a tax return after the due date then this has no effect on the tax decision of the commissioner general including an assessment so a tax return that you file after the due date or in any other manner it has no effect on a tax decision that the commissioner general has made on your behalf so remember this as well then despite all of this he shall take a tax return into account in deciding whether or not you should adjust the assessment so if he wants to make a decision to change your assessment to adjust your assessment he will take into account any tax returns that you filed or that you've probably um, made plans to file so whatever information he has available he will use that um, to assess you what are the rules around you correcting your tax return let's say you file a return you realize you made a mistake are you able to go and amend it yes you can you have the right the law gives room for you to do that what are the specific provisions around correcting an already filed return or an already filed information or document to the commissioner general by saying that the commissioner general is not satisfied with the tax return filed under a tax law then he shall use appropriate powers including those under section 3336 what do you find there those sections cover access to information rights and obligations of a possessor notice to obtain information and an audit i'll cover all of these um, shortly and assets to obtain further information as if as is necessary to make an assessment so if from his perspective if he feels that he is not satisfied what you found he has room to use other avenues to get a correct information or get correct or verified information relating to your tax affairs then we are saying a person cannot or shall not amend or correct a tax return they filed in the commissioner general after the due date for filing without the permission of the commissioner general so it means you can amend your previously filed return but you can't do that without the commissioner general's permission where you discover for some reason that the information you've submitted to the commissioner general in a tax return is incorrect or is misleading in any material respect then you are required to write to the commissioner general ask for permission and then he will allow you to correct your return so remember this um, very important you have there's room to correct a previously found information or return but the commissioner general must give you the go ahead the permission to do this um, very important to remember next is let's talk about audits tax audits what are the provisions around these the commissioner general may in exercise of any power he has under the act audit the tax affairs of a person he has power to do this he may select a person for an audit having regard to a number of factors so the first is the history of the person with respect to compliance or non-compliance if you are a very non-compliance taxpayer he will audit you a lot of times if you are very compliant he will still audit you but obviously we call something audit risk you have an, a lower audit risk than the person who is not compliant so he looks at your history how compliant have you been in deciding whether or not to audit you then the amount of tax payable he will look at probably the amount of tax involved to see whether you are even worth auditing if you are someone very small business table top 100 cds worth of tax payable uh, he won't bother because the amount of tax collected or to be collected is probably going to be less than the cost involved in auditing you so you forget about you then the class of business that you are in so obviously he focuses a lot more on the very um, high profit business on the very priority sectors the oil and gas mining extracted those guys financial services the telecommunication guys like he focuses a lot more on them than other retail business even though he also recently is focusing on very small businesses as well then any criteria he's developed under compliance management plan which may include random selection of returns for audits so if he wants to he can just randomly pick any return and say let's go and audit this guy he has the power to do that or other matters that he may consider relevant for ensuring collection of tax so he looks at a number of factors in determining who to audit that is what you need to take away from here still on audit I say that a person who has been audited may be re-audited if there are reasonable grounds 
particularly having regards to the matters referred to um, in this section. So remember that he can re-audit you. And in, in practice, what happens is sometimes taxpayers are audited multiple times and just an update for those who are interested in what is happening on the ground. Um, the GRA instituted um, a body or unit called the Tax Audit and Quality Assurance Unit. Um, so they are there to ensure that audits conducted are efficient, number one, fair to taxpayers and done to very high standards of audits or tax audits. So there's a unit in there to probably prevent things like um, multiple re-audits, stress on taxpayers and all of that. And then if you remember, if you watch the first video in this series, when I spoke about the structure of the domestic tax revenue division, we said they now have area offices. If you remember, we said we have, we have a large taxpayer office, we have area offices and we have taxpayer service centers. The area offices will now have centralized tax audit functions. So all of these will be there to ensure that audits are smoother, we prevent multiple taxpayer audits among several others. Then apart from this, Commissioner General shall give an advance written notice to a person to be audited. So this is true. He writes to you. He introduces those who come on field to audit to you. So in practice, he writes to you and say, we have decided to audit your accounts. It will cover 2014 to 2019. Your auditors will be Mr. Emmanuel, whatever, Mr. Jeffrey, this, Madame Vera, whatever. He introduces them to you with their contact numbers sometimes so you can interact with them. Then they get in touch with you to let you know what information they'll need to conduct the audit among several others. Then an audit may be conducted for the purpose of more than one tax law. In practice, actually, this is what happens. Um, it's rare to see a tax audit covering one tax in recent times. They do something called a comprehensive tax audit, so you probably see one audit covering your payroll taxes or your PAY, your employee taxes. It will cover withholding taxes, it will cover company income taxes, it will cover your VAT and, and, and the such. So remember that tax audits will or may cover a number of different taxes. So let's let's pause here and we'll continue in our next video. So remember what we've covered here, um, very important principles to understand if you want to get a good grasp on tax administration in Ghana. So if you love this, like I always say, don't forget to smash the like button and to share this video within the network. I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you.